All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another awesome episode of the Fit40 podcast. I have been so excited for this one. I'm not going to lie. I have an incredible guest today. We have Dr. Gabby Gerbino in the house to talk all about that hot topic drug that is the GLP-1s, the Wegovi, the Ozempic, the Semeglutide, Terzepatide, na- you name it, we're going to talk about it. So before I get too ahead of, uh, too ahead of myself, Gabby, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm like I said, I'm a little nervous. I don't do this stuff all the time, but I'm super excited to talk about it because like you said, it's a, such a polarizing topic and I am so passionate about taking that stigma away from these medications and obesity in general. So I'm excited. Awesome. Yeah. And I know me and Gabby were talking about this beforehand, but I do think that the fitness space and just in general, social media needs more of this professional staying in their lane and catching each other and coming up with the best combination possible. So that's what we're going to aim to do. And hopefully everybody learns a ton and gets a lot out of it. Yeah, I hope so. Honestly, like I am really, I think we've talked about this before. Like I'm passionate about bringing those two things together because I obviously, I know the medicine, I learn all the medicine, but when it comes to like fitness, nutrition, those sort of things that you're an expert in, like we, they don't teach us that stuff in medical school. And it's definitely an area that we're lacking, but it's something that has been shown even in the studies when patients do take these medications, that if you combine both the things, you're going to get even better results. And I personally, with my patients, I don't want to put them just on the medication without giving them some sort of knowledge or some sort of something to go off of where it's just like, Hey, just give yourself a shot. But like other things together, if we do all these things together, but I'm not an expert in that. That's where, that's where you come in. And I am no expert when it comes to medicine. I know my, my girlfriend who also is one of Gabby's co-residents, you guys wipe wipe the floor with me when it comes to anything medicine and and all that stuff. So it's good having experts working with each other. Okay. Now, absolutely. Yeah. Let's dive in a little bit and talk and start from the top. What exactly are GLP one inhibitors? Like what do they do and what kind of effect does it have on people's bodies? Right. So obviously the medications that you probably heard about that are the most talked about. So there's semaglutide and there's terazepatide. Um, semaglutide is your Ozempic and your Wagovi. Um, they're literally the same medication. Ozempic was originally developed as a medication for diabetics and then they got it FDA approved for weight loss. And that's how they renamed it Wagovi. Whenever they have like a new FDA approval, they have to rename it, but it's the same medication. And then you have your terazepatide, which is your Manjaro, which Manjaro was originally approved for treatment of diabetes. And then now, if you've heard of the Zepbound, that's the new medication that just became FDA approved for weight loss. So GLP-1s in general, GLP like is this hormone. It's secreted from your intestines and it controls like our response to like our appetite, Um, our caloric intake, and it usually helps to decrease our appetite. So when you eat food and you ingest food, your body secretes GLP-1 to say like, hey, you're good, you ate, let's decrease our appetite. So the point of these medications is that when you give the injection, it goes to these GLP-1 receptors. So you increase the amount of GLP-1 in your body that's being secreted and you decrease your appetite. And not only does it decrease your appetite, but it also slows down your digestion. So you're basically going to feel full a lot quicker. And it's also been shown that it helps with patients that have insulin resistance because we started to use it to treat diabetes and it's had great results. So Insulin resistance is a whole nother topic I could talk about too, but we'll, with the GLP ones itself, the study, the original Ozempic study, the original semaglutide study, it was a 68 week study where they had patients on the semaglutide as well as lifestyle modifications. And then they had a placebo group with lifestyle modifications. The patients that were on the semaglutide with the lifestyle modifications actually had a 10 a 15 to 20% weight loss reduction. I think the average was like 14.9. So some patients had more than others, but weight loss comparable to what we've seen for bariatric surgery. And that was the same thing that we saw with the study. If you look at the um, the study for Zepbound, when it got approved for weight loss as well, the terazepatide, it was very similar. 
But again, they had these studies were done where it wasn't just the semaglutide medication. It was semaglutide and lifestyle modifications. They didn't really expand on what the lifestyle modifications were in the study, but they said it was like decreased caloric intake and obviously increased activity. I wish they had expanded a little bit more to say like exactly what they had the patients do, but I found it really interesting when I was looking through the studies that it wasn't just them just giving the medication to patients. It was giving the medication in combination with lifestyle modifications. And I believe in the one study, they actually did lifestyle modifications for 12 weeks before initiating the medication. So you had the start where you got patients used to these changes in their caloric intake, trying to decrease their caloric intake, as well as increasing their exercise before even initiating the medication. Um, both of the, all the semaglutide and the terazepatide, I'm sure as many people were, they're injectable medications. Um, you have to start at low doses first. So the lowest dose is like 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and then you increase every month. So the reason we do that is to help with any side effects. Most of the side effects that my patients will experience that they'll say is nausea. And that's because I think just in general, like for me personally, when I eat, sometimes I have five minutes to eat. I'm eating so fast and I don't realize. And then I'm like, okay, I'm full. With these medications, you need to eat a lot slower because it's slowing your digestion and, keep, and making you full quicker. So a lot of patients in the beginning, they don't realize that and they eat and then they get full. And then they get nauseous just because you're just full yeah. a lot quicker. That, so that signal is just one... not quick enough. Exactly. Exactly. And I think sometimes it's like, a, like, I feel like we're just in a rush sometimes. Like, I'm sure like you have five minutes to eat sometimes in between the day, like whatever it is going on. So that's like the biggest thing when I initiate these medications with my patients, the biggest thing I tell them is that even at the lower doses, you may not feel that nausea but eat slower because you're not going to realize how full you are until you're full kind of thing. Like eat a lot slower, realize what that full feeling is, and then it'll help you in the long run as far as eating. Um, and a lot of patients that are on these medications too will say that a lot of their cravings went away, like their cravings for sugar, like fatty foods, those sort of things. A lot of those cravings, because these GLP-1 receptors are going after those receptors in our brain to try to decrease those cravings. And I actually was talking to somebody who was saying there's a study possibly coming out too about these medications that are going to be helpful in patients that are like um, struggling with addiction wow. because yeah, it's, 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 they're coming, they're going to come out with a lot of things, but because of the receptors and where they are in the brain and what they go after it helps with some of these like cravings that you may not think that you have or just things that have been embedded in you since you were a kid like I know my daughter eats candy like it's going out of style like it's just yeah you're a kid you grow up you eat sugary things it's just what you do so these medications could actually help with those like kind of sugary cravings as well so I know it's like a lot of information I hope I didn't talk too much oh, no. you you nailed too much it so far <laughs> you nailed it because that was actually one of my big questions because i know i am in a lot of the support groups when it comes to semaglutide semaglutide and terazepatide i've been saying it wrong this entire time terazepatide <laughs> and i'm in these support groups and nausea is definitely one of the big ones that comes up and that's mm -hmm. interesting how you mm -hmm. say it's really like it could be from speed eating which is unfortunately one of those habits we fall into i know me personally, I had to literally set timers on my watch that are for 10, 15 minutes and like stretch the meal that long. So if anybody listening right now is like, how do I eat slower? I just kind of eat like that. Set a timer and like put it in view, like as you're eating. That's one way. That's a great idea. I never even thought about that, but it is, it's, it's probably the most common side effect that patients will experience. And the thing with the nausea that I have noticed in some patients, and I will tell you, like you as well as your listeners from my experience, I, I was on Ozempic myself. Um, I'm currently pregnant, so I've stopped taking the medication, but I was on the medication itself. And I would notice that 
most of my nausea would be usually the day after I took my first shot. So like if say I usually would take my shot on a Monday, like Tuesday would when the nausea would be slightly more enhanced, I guess. But because of the effect of the medication, it kind of wears off as the week goes on. So the nausea kind of gets a little bit better. But for the most part, most of the patients that do experience nausea, once they kind of realize when they're eating and how fast they're eating, then they don't really deal with those symptoms as much. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm glad that you mentioned that like you're currently not taking it because of being pregnant, which congratulations. But I know that there's a lot of people that unfortunately should not, or not unfortunately, but they should not be taking this medication. So let's talk about who exactly is it for? Because I know this is one of the polarizing topics when people are like, there's too many people taking it. There's not enough of it for the people that need it. Like who are the people that actually need it? Right, need the medication. So as far as the medication itself, semaglutide, if you are a diabetic, you are diagnosed as a diabetic, as in your hemoglobin A1C, which is the measurement that we use, is greater than 6.4, 6.5, and you're diagnosed a diabetic. These medications, perfect for you. The other weight loss indications are if you have a BMI greater than 30, or you have a BMI greater than 27, and you have some sort of comorbidity. Comorbidity being like you have high blood pressure, you have high cholesterol, you have diabetes, those things that all go together with what we call the metabolic syndrome. Um, so that's basically the quali- I guess we would say the qualifications. You at least have to have a BMI of 30 if you have no other medical problems. Um, and if not, and if you're 27 and you have some sort of medical condition, then you qualify. Obviously, if you're a diabetic, you always qualify. But it's actually been fairly difficult these days because there are a lot of insurance companies who are being very particular about covering the medication. And that's another that's another thing we can talk about as well, because there's a lot of these companies out there that are advertising the medication too. Yeah. And they're, I mean, let's call a spade a spade. Weight Watchers came out and everybody lost their shit and was like, oh my God, they're pushing medication. Oh my God. And I actually follow one of the, one of the guys that is in charge of the medical team that's in charge of that. And they definitely, the marketing team and the medical team need to get on the same page (laughs) because the marketing is like, it's for everyone. And then you actually listen to them talk and they're like, listen, we're just making it available to people that otherwise would not have the ability to have a practitioner that's familiar with this stuff. Right. Right. Cause they're really, not that there isn't, not that all practitioners shouldn't be familiar with it, but there's obviously some of us that are more familiar with it or just more comfortable with it than others, just because it is a fairly new medication. But like you said, these Weight Watchers, and obviously if you've seen people on social media and these influencers who may or may all not the be real on it. Wives. <laughs> right, right. Who really technically shouldn't qualify for it because it's not yeah. for these people. Like if your BMI is... 24, you shouldn't qualify for these medications. These are patients that are what we consider like class one, class two, class three obesity and all the classes, but at least you have to at least have a BMI of 30. Um, and I always use that as a cutoff for my patients. Yeah. And I think there does have to be some sort of a common sense, like cut off because if I really wanted to, I technically fall into the criteria that you listed that would qualify because I have high cholesterol because it's genetic and I have to make a concerted effort to bring it down, which I'm doing through lifestyle modification. But I mean, as the consumer, I think a lot of us need to take responsibility and be like, listen, if I'm like in that zone, why don't I try and do it myself first? Mm -hmm. Right. And I will say that for my patients, if they come into my office and they are just the, it's the first time I'm meeting them and they just say to me, Hey, I want Ozempic. I say first, like, let's have a conversation first. Have you tried anything else first? It's not something that I think that you can just give to patients without having a conversation and say, have you ever tried diet or lifestyle changes? What do you do on a daily basis to help lose weight this because this isn't a quick fix and this isn't something that you can just take and lose weight and then go back to your daily life these medications are 
And actually, the studies have shown that these medications, if patients struggle with their weight, should be lifelong medications. They're not medications that we should be stopping because obesity is a chronic illness and it's just like treating high blood pressure and high cholesterol and diabetes that these medications are lifelong medications and you can't just, if you've never tried anything else, I would really, I always encourage my patients to at least try diet and lifestyle changes first Come if they've never tried anything else and then come back to me after a month. And if they've tried those things, they've implemented exercise, they've implemented changes in their diet and they're still not losing weight, then let's talk about the medication options that are available for you. But these medications are lifelong medications to really treat obesity as a chronic illness. Yeah. And I think that's an important point to touch on. Like, I don't want to get too off topic from it, but I think it plays a big role in understanding that obesity is a disease. Like people want to argue left and right that it's like, it's just all these people are so fucking lazy. Like they don't want it bad enough. It's like, meanwhile, that person's making like eight figures and you're making four bitching and moaning, but they're clearly more lazy than you. Um, <laughs> sorry, I won't get too off topic, but, um, <laughs> When it comes to obesity as a disease, what exactly qualifies it? Because I don't think a lot of people understand that when you are obese for like a prolonged period of time, it messes your body up. Like it changes mm -hmm. things a lot. Mm -hmm. So obesity itself as a chronic illness can cause, like we know, multiple different things. So usually obesity comes in what I call this like metabolic, or in the medical world, we call it a metabolic syndrome. Patients that have obesity most oftentimes have high blood pressure, most oftentimes have high cholesterol, most oftentimes struggle with depression, they may struggle with anxiety and mental illness. Like it's not just one thing. And there's actually been like multiple studies that have even shown that obesity has an impact on like, our health system in general, and how like the cost of the health system because of obesity itself because usually unfortunately patients that do struggle with their weight and do qualify as obese which goes back to your bmi um and your bmi being greater than 30 or 27 with comorbidities and you qualifying as in that category it's it costs more money to treat these patients because they're usually on multiple different medications and they may be dealing with multiple different health issues. They're at higher risk for heart attacks, higher risk for stroke, higher risk for what we call like peripheral artery disease, blood clots. Like there's so many things that go into obesity in general as a chronic illness. And it's not just like you said, it's not just, oh, you're lazy and you can't lose weight. Like there's a whole genetic component that goes into it. There is so much stuff that goes into it that they're doing a lot of like research into now. But it's it we really need to think about it as a chronic illness and not just like you said, like, oh, you're just lazy and won't stop eating. Like it's not. I can tell you from my personal experience and struggling with weight loss and trying to lose weight my whole life, like it is it is not easy. And it was I tried, I did Weight Watchers, I did Jenny Craig, I did those diets where I was cutting out literally eating nothing. I probably like counted my calories eating like 500 calories a day, which is not healthy at all either. And still not losing a pound, like an ounce and being so frustrated on the scale, but then realizing that I had insulin resistance and all these other things going on. And, and, um, I feel like I'm getting like sidetracked, but basically like obesity itself is, there's so many things that go into it. 100%. 100%. I'm glad that we brought that up for the for the audience because I think that's one of those things that a lot of people like either have one, they're for or against and there's like the healthy at every size movement that tries to ignore the fact that it's extremely unhealthy to be that way. And then you got the people that are like, "Ah, they're all lazy." So, I'm glad that we touched on that. So, everybody has the information that they need. Now, um I think another thing that we talked about too that you brought up is the fact that like there's food noise and i think that's one of the best things that has come of this discussion as a whole is the general population understanding that food noise is a very real thing for a lot of people like there's some of us that get hungry around mealtime and then there's others of us that are thinking about food 24 7. yep mm -hmm. and a lot of my patients yeah. will say that 
that they deal with that and they just feel like this constant urge to eat. And like you said, there are some people who don't feel that urge. And there are others who are like, oh, okay, it's 12 o'clock. Like I need to eat right now. Or I'm always thinking about my next, my next meal and that sort of thing. Like it's, it's a real thing. Yeah. hundred percent. Because I know many, many people will like not, not understand this, but there are some people who like go on vacation and they have six, seven, eight meals a day because they have the ability to, but then there's some of us that are like, so their whole vacation revolves around food. And it's like, well, some people do do it that way because of that reason. And it's just, it can be wild sometimes understanding how other people live. Sometimes we get so stuck in our bubble. Um, yes. And then the other thing. The other thing I wanted to touch on was the lifestyle modification that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Or actually, before we go into that, quick question about the long-term effects, because that's also another trigger point when it comes to the debate. When it comes to the long-term side effects, clearly GLP-1s have been around for a lot longer than a lot of people know. What are the actual side effects long-term or how long have they been around and what have we seen? So we've been using GLP-1s to treat diabetes for years before we even thought about using it to treat weight loss or using it in the weight loss realm. The long-term effects, there really aren't any that I know of personally. Like, I don't know of any patients that have experienced long-term effects from the medication. The very, very rare ones that you may hear of that patients will talk about um, and that have been in the news is what they call gastroparesis or this kind of idea that your stomach is paralyzed. Now, this is very, very, very rare, but you hear about it in one person and then the whole world hears about it. And the reason why these things happen and gastroparesis or this paralyzing idea of the stomach happens is because the medication itself slows down your digestion. So just think about like, if you're not using something, it's going to get rusty kind of thing. If you leave your car in the driveway and you don't turn it on for many, many days, your battery is going to die. So when you slow down your digestion and you're slowing down how the food moves through your stomach, your stomach just gets a little lazy. Um, but if you are still eating when you should be eating, you're still eating the amount of calories that you should be eating throughout the day, you really should avoid these side effects. A lot of times this happens when patients don't have any, they don't have, you're not going to have those hunger signals, if that makes sense when you're on this medication. So you have to, okay, it's breakfast. I'm going to eat a good amount of protein. I tell my patients they should at least be eating a hundred grams of protein a day, which I know. So I don't know. You can tell me if that's wrong, but it sounds like a we'll, lot. We'll of protein, get into it, but we'll get into it. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> But if a lot of these patients, because they don't have that hunger sensation, they don't eat. So when you don't eat, your stomach gets lazy. It's not doing anything, but because they don't feel hungry, they don't feel the need to eat. So that's something that I do really, really instill in my patients and say, you are not going to feel hungry. You're most likely not going to feel thirsty either. You have to eat and you have to drink and you will avoid that very, very rare side effect. But that's the the one that I've heard of. That's the long-term effects of the medication. Um, and then obviously a couple studies that I've looked at now are the effects of stopping the medication. So a lot of the studies that I've read are if patients don't implement any diet or lifestyle changes and they do stop the medication, there is a chance that they are going to gain weight back. And I know that I've heard that a lot in the media where patients have been on the medication and then they stop the medication and they're like, oh, well, I gained it back and more. And that is one thing where I feel like the lifestyle modifications and really implementing those lifestyle changes can make a difference, but also understanding that this medication shouldn't really be stopped. It's something that should be long-term unless you really feel confident that you've made those changes and then you can continue those long-term. But patients that struggle with insulin resistance, patients that have PCOS, those sort of things are not going to go away. Um, so these are medications that you should be on forever. But if you do stop the medication, there is a chance of gaining I think the last study I read was about five to 10% of the weight back. 
Yeah. And any fitness professional hearing this is like no shit <laughs> because like we <laughs> see it all the time. People hop on diets, they change everything about their life and then they go back to quote unquote normal eating. And then all of a sudden you go back to the way you were because you are eating exactly the same. It kind of makes sense. Right. But right. I think it's not, it's not a quick fix. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, there are a good chunk of people that are hopping on this medication, expecting it to be some wonder drug where they don't have to change anything. Right. And that's the downside of social media, which I've seen this so much is that they just think it's like this. I have patients that come to me all the time and they're like, well, my friend is on it and she lost all this weight and she's doing so great. And of course, the medication does wonders and it's going to help you, but it's not a miracle drug and it's not a quick fix. And it's not going to be like, okay, you're on the medication for a couple months, you lose the weight and then you can stop the medication. If you haven't changed, like you're saying, haven't changed anything and expect to just be like, okay, I'm good now. Bye. Like, that's it. I'm done. Like, it's a quick fix. I lost my, I lost my five pounds and now I feel better. Like that's not, it's definitely not what the medication is, was made for or developed for. Yeah. Cause I, at least from the outsider looking in, I feel like if you have 50 to a hundred pounds to lose, it's like, those are the people that it's for. It's not for the vanity weight of 10 to 20 pounds where it's like, I just want to look good in my, my swimsuit, or I just want to feel, I just want to like drop that couple. It's like, that's not what this right. is for. No, this is for people that have struggled. Like you said, struggle with their weight, their whole life. They may or may not qualify for bariatric surgery, or maybe they just don't, they're not a good candidate for surgery. These are other things that we think about too, because bariatric surgery has been around for many, many years, and it is an option for patients that have a BMI greater than 30. But they may not be a good candidate for bariatric surgery if they have any heart conditions, if they have any sort of sleep apnea, anything that's going to be a contradiction to them going under anesthesia. Um, so, but these, it's just, it's frustrating to see on social media when you see like these people using the medication and just for that five pounds. And I'm like, you're making my job harder because <laughs> yep. I can't explain this to people sometimes. When something works, you better believe it's going to be abused. <laughs> But I guess so. And that's, that's the problem now is that they're, everything's back. Like a lot of these medications now are on back order because of that. Yeah. Yeah. But hopefully things will improve. We'll get a better supply of it. And the people that do truly need it can get it. Now we were on the topic of uh, side effects and I just, I've seen a couple pop up that I want to just get your take on. I know nausea was like the big, the big one, but the second one, the like very close second is constipation. Now, is there any medical reason for that? Because my theory was always that like a lot of people in general suffer from constipation because they, most people don't get anywhere near the dietary fiber that they should be getting. Now, is there something with the medication that increases the chance for constipation in general or what's the deal with that? So, yeah, so it's some of what you said, but it also goes back to the same concept of slowing your digestion down. So if we're slowing our, our digestion, we're literally slowing down our entire digestive tract. And when we do that, we basically allow like our colon to absorb more of the water, which is going to make our stool harder. And it's just everything just slows down. So I do recommend for my patients to increase their fiber intake. I also recommend for my patients, if necessary, they can take a probiotic or they can take like a stool softener if they feel like it's affecting them. I don't, I think I've had more patients complain of the nausea than I have constipation, but I do have patients that will complain of it, but it all goes back to the same concept of it just slowing your digestion down. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. And the other one that comes up a lot too is hair loss. Now, I'll give you my theory and I love, I kind of like this. So I'll give you my theory. You tell me the, the legit answer. So I think that a lot of these are just like uh, hair loss is one of the side effects of very, very like high malnourishment. Like people just getting to the point where they don't want to eat anything. So they literally don't eat anything. And then they start experiencing the side effects of starvation, of eating super low calorie for a long time and actually adhering, not having those binges on the weekend that actually make up for it. 
Mm-hmm. You're probably right. Honestly, I haven't had any patients complain of hair loss, but it it makes sense because, and this is the biggest thing with the medication and why I really, really tell my patients they have to eat because you're right. It If you don't have those hunger signals and you're not eating and you basically go into starvation mode, you're lacking nutrients, all these things that makes your hair grow, your nails, all these other things. Um, I haven't honestly had any patients experience hair loss, but your logic it does make a lot of sense. Cool. <laughs> and like it, it makes it makes sense logically for sure. Yeah, because the the one thing that came to mind when I'm seeing this hair loss stuff is like hair, skin, and nails, especially for the ladies, is a very, very big priority. And I've mm-hmm. had clients tell me that once they get enough protein in the diet, when their diet improves, all of a sudden hair, skin, nails feel amazing. It's not because they just added in a, a collagen supplement or something. It's because they're eating mm-hmm. enough of the right things. Now, I'm guessing that when you do that, it could potentially combat the hair loss. Absolutely. Absolutely. It all goes back to our nutrition and what we're eating and the things that we're putting in our body. Absolutely. And for the one client that I know is listening, whose toenail literally grew back, like you're, you're who I'm talking about. You know who you are. (laughs) That's Um, awesome. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And the other last thing I had on the list was the non-responders. Like, are there people that will take this medication no matter how high the dose, no matter how high you crank it up and they're just like, this shit ain't working. Yeah, there is, there is that group of patients that it just unfortunately doesn't work for. And that goes back to any of the medications that we have for um, weight loss and obesity. So there's not just the injectables, there's other medications, but not every medication works for every patient. So there are patients that experience weight loss with these medications and may experience a plateau. There are some patients who just don't experience any weight loss with the medication at all. And it can be, it can be frustrating, but um, that's, that's sometimes what I do with my patients. If I realize that it's the, if they're on the semaglutide, um, what I'm trying to do now is switch them to the terazepatide because the semaglutide is just a GLP-1 um, agonist. And then the terazepatide is actually a GLP plus a GIP, which is a other hormone. So it just might be that their body reacts better to that hormone versus the GLP. But there is a small group of patients that just unfortunately don't, can't benefit from the medication or their body just doesn't doesn't react to it. And we really don't know why we're not really sure. There's not much research yet as to why there are a select few of patients who um, don't get the weight loss that the studies have shown. Gotcha. And it sounds like that's a really good case for why you should talk to your doctor about what's best for you in your situation. Because I know that there's a lot of people getting compounded. There's a lot of people getting these like back alley versions of it that are experiencing some really negative side effects and, or just not getting any results at all. Have you experienced any patients coming in, like doing that or like, and have you heard of it? So I have heard of it and it scares me a lot. And I tell my patients, I would rather you come to me and talk to, if it's not me, talk to a physician because when it comes to any compounding pharmacy or any of these things that you see online where you can just like text somebody and get semaglutide sent to you, you don't know that it's actually semaglutide being sent to you. You really don't know what you're getting with these compounded pharmacies. And that's very, very scary. Um, you could have crazy side effects. Who even knows? I haven't had any patients, um, fortunately, come to me after dealing with that or having that experience. But for those patients that are using those other outlets or those compounding pharmacies and they're paying a lot of money out of pocket, you don't really know what you're getting, which is a little concerning because you could be getting like water in a syringe at that or saline in a syringe, whatever it is. Um, so those things, those things that are out there do scare me a lot because who knows what you're getting. Yeah. That's, it's terrifying. It reminds me of like when I was in college and there were, and even now there's like online buy steroids at this, at this location or at this website oh, and you have no idea what the hell you're getting. <laughs> like it's right. the wild west. Right, right. There's so many, there's so many studies of just 
many medications. If you've gotten anything off the street, if you've heard of patients getting like testosterone off the street and then ending up in like liver failure because who knows what you're getting. So there's a lot of dangerous dangerous medications out there that we want to be careful of. Um, and not even that, if you're paying, like a lot of these people that I've heard of that are paying $300, $350, whatever it is for these medications from these compounding pharmacies. And I'm like, make sure you're actually getting the medication because you could be paying $300 for saline in a syringe. Like you don't know what you're putting in your body. Now that's one hell of a profit margin right there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And exactly. I, and I've I actually... Lose- I can't believe it either because I hear four, five, six hundred dollars, and I'm like, I'm cheaper to work with, and I will get you better results than saline in a syringe. But have at it, right, right. And actually, I was talking to my mom the other day, and she saw like a a sign or billboard or something of some like Medi Spa where you can go, you pay seventy five dollars a month or $75 a week, I'm sorry. And every week you go and they give you your injection of semaglutide. Now, I don't know if it's actually some, I would hope so because usually it's a physician that's a part of these many spas, but the profit is insane to me. Like yep. the amount yep. of money that they could be making off of these patients, if you're going $75 every single week for who knows how many weeks because you at least need every time you go up, there's four doses of the medication. So it's at least four weeks for that's a lot of money. But Hey, if you get it, if you get it like packaged, kind of like the streaming services. Now you get Hulu with Disney plus, if you can get (laughs) Ozempic and an ice sculpt and a Botox treatment, I mean, you're really, it pays for itself. Right. It's all in one. It's like all, all nicely, neatly packaged (laughs) together. You know, you get all of your things nicely together. And and we're, we're officially in that wellness category that isn't actually wellness or health. We're in that section of health and fitness and wellness. That is, if it makes money, it makes sense. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the Medi spas and those, those things of the world. Like they, I think some things have their place, but I think that, I will tell you that I did not go into the medical field to make money. Um, I'm sure you are well aware we are in a lot of debt when we go into medical, when we finish <laughs> medical school. And I did not go into medical it's, school. It's I did hitting not in become August. a doctor. It's hitting in August. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I keep like, it doesn't exist. It doesn't <laughs> exist. But like, I didn't go into medicine to to make money or try to profit off of my patients. I went into medicine because I really wanted to help people. And it's, And for me, at least, like, I guess, like, it bothers me. Like, it really upsets me when I see people spending all this money when I don't even know if they're really getting the help that they really need um, and kind of getting taken advantage of it. Actually, like, it, like, truly bothers me. Oh, 100%. Because you're doing the good work and you have, it really comes down to the conversation of what's the incentive? Are you going to a, a medi spa where it's like, how much can we squeeze out of you? Or are you going to a doctor that's like, I don't even know the price on this. I'm just doing what's best for you. Exactly. Exactly. And I was like, that's a whole nother conversation we can get into because medicine has been so polarizing lately, but yeah, that's, it's, it's sad to me when I see people getting taken advantage of, especially in this kind of like wellness medi spa kind of universe where yeah. they're paying all this money for who knows what. Hey, all, or, all I'm saying is if I'm going to get like, if I'm going to get hosed financially, I'd rather it be by an, a hospital than some back alley, some med spa. Cause at least I know it's legit stuff. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Like I promise you that I'm not trying to profit off of (laughs) any of my patients. I make zero dollars when I prescribe Ozempic or Wagovi or any of these medications. I just want to help you. We need need transparency here. Sometimes those reps bring some tasty lunches. You got it. You got to let the people know. I will be transparent. I am sorry. I will let the people know that sometimes we get a tasty lunch, some free coffee every once in a while. I will be transparent. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'll I'll give you that. I was like, I'll be very transparent. I apologize. They'll prescribe anything for Panera. Just 
anything, really. <laughs> I know. We get way too much Panera. Panera, <laughs> you know Panera's story. But, oh, yeah. Uh... <laughs> but anyway, before we get but, too off yeah, topic. Yeah, we do get that. <laughs> now, now we're going to shift things a little bit. You had, your fir- you had the first half. Now I'm going to take over in the second. And what I want you to do is like Go I'm going to – give everybody from a trainer's perspective the best way to exercise the best way to go about your nutrition so that you can really reap the best benefits from this medication because like we said shit ain't cheap it does carry the potential for side effects you might as well get the most bang for your buck when you're on it if you plan to do it for a short time or a long time so what i'm asking of dr Girbino is to cut me off at any point and say whoa 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 (laughs) There's a reason that we don't want to do that. <laughs> Sounds fair. I will. I will try to be. Yeah, I will try to be. I'll try to be nice. Try not to cut you off too much. All right. Cool. Cool. So first thing that my biggest question with all of this is when people are on the medications, does it change their calorie requirements? Like something say like thyroid, for example, when people's thyroid levels are off or they are insulin resistant and their calorie needs are much lower than somebody who is quote unquote healthy. Like, does this carry that same type of effect on the body? No, it shouldn't. So that's the, that's the biggest thing that I instill in my patients is you, your calorie intake should still be the same. You may need to eat slower and you may need to eat like maybe smaller meals throughout the day, but that does not mean that you should not still be meeting what your goals are, but your goals for weight loss. So you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I know there's all of these calculators and things that you can use. I think I've heard of, there's like a TDEE calculator I think I've heard of before um, that I recommend to my patients to use to show them what they should be taking in so that they're still in a calorie deficit and they can still lose weight, but they are still getting the nutrients that they need and they're still eating enough throughout the day. I have all my patients bring in a food diary and I have them write everything out. And oftentimes they'll come in and they're not even eating close to enough. They're eating like 500 calories a day because they don't, like I said, they don't have that hunger signal. So they feel like, oh, let me not eat. And sometimes that's actually hurting their progress. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are side effects to eating too few. Now, I'm glad you brought up the TDEE calculator, because it can get a little bit confusing when it comes to the number of calories. TDEE is your total daily energy expenditure. And that is comprised of four things, your basal metabolic rate, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, your thermic effect of food and exercise, like active exercise. And when you combine all of that, that's how many calories you need to maintain your body weight in a range of like three to five pounds, give or take. Now, if you want to lose about a pound of weight, per week, you take 500 calories away from that. Now, some people can take more like 750 or to a thousand calories off of that. If their total daily energy expenditure is really high because they're really active or they're very heavy, those people can get away with taking away more, but you never want to go below your basal metabolic rate because your basal metabolic rate is that number of calories that your body needs to be burning at rest to be able to function at bare minimum. And when you go under that, right. that's where the negative stuff starts happening, like where you have extremely low energy, where sometimes your sleep gets affected. Like a lot of bad things happen when you don't eat enough food, like hair loss, for example, like hair, skin and nails don't like that. Okay. So that's where we want to be with the calories as far as like what the bare minimum is, which I think is more important than getting them high enough for a lot of people. Some people just need to get to like at least their basal metabolic rate. And if you want to, I have my own Mm -hmm. calculator. I'll put it in the show notes. And what that does is it calculates your BMR and then adds 200 calories. So you have a range from your baseline, that basal metabolic rate to like 200 extra calories where you can sit in that calorie range. And if you're a little on the higher end one day, fine. If you're on the lower end one day, fine. As long as you're in that sweet spot, you will lose weight and you'll be able to fully nourish yourself so that you can actually do what you need to do without the negative side effects. And I like how- No, that's- I'm learning things too. I don't see, I don't, they don't teach us these things. So (laughs) I'm interested. Keep going. 
I'm just, <laughs> we're just going to send this into all the med schools and be like, just play this for one day. Just put it on the projector. <laughs> um, Seriously, I've been <laughs> preaching that we need nutrition and like these conversations in medical school for so long. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I want to hear yeah. all, all Hell of it. Yeah. It'll help. It'll help me with my patients. Yep. And then one of the things that all of the really good nutrition coaches will tell you, because there's people that go nuts on macros, like you need this much protein, this much carbs, this much fat. And meanwhile, people barely know how to count their calories. So it's pretty much an exercise in futility. But when we're talking about macros that matter, protein and is the big one because in all the studies that show the differences between high carb, low carb, high fat, low fat, when protein and calories are equated, they're pretty much all exactly the same as far as results go. And then the ones that are the ones that last the longest, that get you the best results are the ones that you prefer, that you actually enjoy sticking to. Now, that being said, when you're in a more insulin resistant category, like people like women, for example, who are in that 40 plus category that are potentially in perimenopause or have hit menopause, sometimes they do better with higher fats, lower carbs, because sometimes when it, people are insulin insulin resistant, dropping the carbs and upping the fat helps them feel better and perform better. But that being said, if you have trouble tracking, there's no point in trying to do that because you're just going to piss yourself off at the fact that you can't stick with it. So let's just focus on protein right. for now. And then if you want, you can optimize from that point. So when it comes to protein, you want around 0 0.7 to one grams per pound of body weight. And if you want to get real particular, okay. you, if you hop on an in body scale or something like that, you could do it by your lean body mass. But if you don't have access to that, you could do it by your goal body weight. Cause a lot of times that's kind of close, but a hundred grams is a very, very good starting point for a lot of people because it's like, okay. it's, I was like, am I telling my patients the wrong thing? <laughs> no, like, no, I, hope, no. I hope not. <laughs> no, it's a very good thing to get in the habit of at least in the triple digits because the RDA is lower than that. The RDA is like somewhere for most people. If you do the calculation, it's in that like 50 to 75 grams a day. And it's like, you, like some people need to do that 50 grams in a meal. So you want to be mm -hmm. very conscious of that, especially if you're active, because in all honesty, if you're not doing challenging exercise and you're not very, a very active person, your protein requirements are not going to be the same as somebody who is. So if you are active and you lift weights, you're going to need to go to that 0.7 to 1.0 grams. And that'll usually put you in a really, really good spot. That being said, a lot of people are not good at tracking. And in general, humans really do suck at at putting down how much we actually eat. Studies have shown this. Yes. Okay. On average, yeah. I think it's yeah. something nuts, like three or 500 calories of difference usually. But that's not to deter people because even putting food down in a journal will result in you eating less than ad libitum, which is the fancy term for however you want. <laughs> Right, right. And that's why I have my patients do that food diary because a lot of the time, like, they don't really, like, you don't realize sometimes. And even I do it myself. Like, I eat my breakfast and then I start snacking on something else or you grab something. Like, you don't realize until you actually put it down on paper what you're actually eating or how much you're really taking in. And is it nutritious? Am I getting enough protein? And am I getting what I should be getting throughout the day? Exactly. Exactly. And if anybody listening right now is like, I don't even know where to begin with protein. One of the best things that I've seen work out for a lot of people is one, try your best to eat mostly whole or minimally processed foods. Things like if it's in a bag, make sure it's good food that's in a bag, like a salad or some like lean chicken or something like that, or frozen vegetables, things like that are minimally processed good foods. And the other thing is try and get a palm size of protein at every single meal. So if you were to chop off all your fingers and you would just have your palm on a plate, as delicious as that sounds, okay, if you're having meat, that's about the serving size that you want. And that's going to be specific to your body size, because unless you have abnormally small or large hands, for most people, it's going to be about right. And for the ladies in general, one is a good amount. For guys, it's usually about two palms every single meal. Now, the problem is usually breakfast. So like, if you can get 20 grams in a protein shake, that would be about a palm size. So if you need two protein shakes or one protein shake, or you want to do like a handful of eggs, that's totally fine. 
but those are some simple ways to get more yeah, I was protein. Gonna, I was going to ask, like, how do you feel about the protein shakes? Because a lot of my patients ask me, yeah. is a protein shake, is that okay? Like, say, if I want to drink a Premier Pro or something, whatever those protein shakes are, is that okay for protein or should I be eating a bunch of eggs or something else? There's two things here. One is that anytime you're drinking your food, you're not getting one, the same amount of fullness because that volume in your stomach is not the same as actually eating the food. And it's also not going to take as long to go through your digestive tract. So if you are eating your food and you're on Ozempic or something, it's going to be extremely slow. But if you're drinking and you're taking Ozempic or whatever, then it's going to go a little bit faster. Um, yeah, a lot of my patients say yeah. it's just easier when sometimes when they're on the medication, sometimes they feel like it's easier for them to drink their protein because at least they know they're getting the protein. And like you said, it doesn't make them feel that as full because it will go through the digestive, tra like digestive tract a little quicker than if they ate like an actual full on breakfast. Yeah. And then along with that, the second thing is the absorption. So a lot of people do have issues when it comes to dairy, when it comes to certain additives that they put in there. Sometimes if you get some of these cheap ones, they really cut it with a lot of things that could be potential irritants to your body. So when it comes to protein, you kind of want to find that middle ground of not super pricey, but not super cheap because a lot of the quality gets lost in the cheaper ones. Um, but that being said, you want to know what your irritants are. So like if you are allergic or sensitive to gluten, dairy or anything, make sure that they're not in that. Like people want to talk shit on vegan stuff, but honestly, when it comes to protein, it's not bad because when you have vegan protein sources that don't irritate you and then you eat meat later in the day or around it, you're getting all those essential amino acids that people talk shit on that say you're not getting all of your aminos. But if you are later in the day, then you are getting a complete source of protein. Is it as ideal as getting nothing but meat and dairy throughout the, the day? Probably not. But we're not after what's 100% best. We're after what's going to get you the best results, which is going to be what you can realistically do. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's so great. Like, it's so great to hear because a lot of the patients that I work with, they're working people, working moms or working dads, whatever it is, and, or they're just busy. So like finding things that are attainable and things that they could actually do in their day-to-day -day life is so nice to hear rather than a lot of the other like fitness things you hear where they're just like, no, you have to do this no matter what. And I'm like, well, that doesn't work for me and my lifestyle or like I, I have celiac disease, so I'm completely gluten free. My husband is lactose intolerant. So we try to have that in our lifestyle. And a lot of the time, like it's, we try to find those protein shakes. It's hard. You got to like read every single ingredient so sometimes it's for us, it's easier to just eat like a whole, for me, I just make an egg is a lot easier because I know there's nothing in it that's going to make me sick that day. Yeah. And that's another case for like one of the best things that results in people losing a lot of weight without changing anything at all, taking medication or changing things intentionally is literally just cooking at home more because people don't realize when you go to a restaurant, the, the, amount of calories compared to at home is on average, almost double the amount of calories it would be at home. Right. And even price wise too, the amount of, to go out to eat, I feel like the price is like skyrocketed too, to go out to dinner than it would be if I just buy the groceries and I like cook it at home. Exactly. But you're like you said, you're controlling more of what's in your food and how much you're putting in your food. Exactly. And that'll help you pay for your medication. Bing, bang, boom. <laughs> Bing, bang, boom. We're saving money here, people. Yep. And hey, trying to maybe save even, money everywhere. Maybe even a coach too. Who knows? But yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty much the big rocks when it comes to nutrition is getting an understanding of your calorie count because calories drive the scale one way or another. You could have the world's most messed up hormones. There have been people on desert islands in prison camps that have had horrible hormonal profiles that have been starved that still lost weight. So at the end of the day, calories matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's always been, I, at least the only thing I think I do understand and from nutrition standpoint is always like calories in, calories out, like calories matter. And that whole concept 
is something that like we i feel like we forget sometimes yeah and and i but even with these medications you still have to eat enough calories i want to reiterate that and people don't understand you can't just stop eating and you're going to lose weight yeah you still need to eat you your body still needs nourishment you're gonna feel like absolute garbage if you are taking these medications and only drinking a cup of water a day and eating one protein shake or whatever it is a day like that is not enough to sustain you yeah and i think that in the conversation a lot of times it gets lost that like for some reason people feel that when they're insulin resistant when their thyroid is all out of whack they feel like no matter what they do no matter how few calories they eat they can't lose weight but in reality, there is a number of calories that would result in you losing weight. The problem is that it's not sustainable. You cannot stick to that and right. live your life. That's what these medications are for. Right. That's what these lifestyle modifications are for, to allow you to put yourself in a position where those calories are livable. Right. And I, I love that you mentioned the insulin resistance because it's something that I'm so passionate about because people don't understand that like when you're insulin resistant, your body holds on to fat easier. You're going to crave sugar. You're going to crave carbs and your body's going to hold on to all of that. You could eat 500 calories a day and not lose a pound if you have that insulin resistance because your body is just going to hold on to every single ounce of fat and you're not going to be able to lose what you need to lose. Yeah or what you want to lose. 100%. Now just curious. And I check all of like I check all of my patients for insulin resistance too. Yeah. Sorry. Just curious, what you do off. you think the calorie amount would be like if somebody was insulin resistant to the point where it's like they have to eat so little just to lose any little bit of weight? Like if you were to like ballpark it, how many do you think somebody would have to eat to lose any weight with that level of it? <laughs> That I don't, I honestly don't know the answer to that because everybody's different. Everybody's body is different. And I think a lot of the time when we don't eat enough, like if they're only eating 500 calories a day and they're still not losing weight, it's just, that's the struggle of insulin resistance. Yeah. They just, they will not lose weight no matter how much they eat, no matter too little, too less, too little, too less. That was the same thing. I'm sorry. That's okay. Too much, too less. <laughs> Like they just, they won't lose weight at all because your body is going to hold on to, to every ounce of fat. It's yeah. more about with insulin resistance. It's more about what you're eating rather than the amount of calories that you're eating. Like there have been studies that have shown with that patients with insulin resistance, you want to eat lower carb because you don't want to give your body any reason to basically secrete insulin in our body. So when you eat carbs that turn into sugar, your body's going to secrete insulin. When you secrete that insulin, it's going to hold on to everything. So there have been a lot of studies that have shown that lower carb lifestyles, and I'm not saying keto or crazy low carb, I'm saying lower carb lifestyles, um, do better for patients with insulin resistance. So I think it's more about what you're eating rather than like the amount of calories. But like, I couldn't tell you a number, honestly, because it kind of varies for everybody. Gotcha. And I was always curious on that too, when it comes to carbs, because I think there's a big, big misunderstanding when it comes to the types of carbs. Because when we say, oh, we can't have any carbs automatically, it's like no cookies, no ice cream, no, none of this stuff. And when we're talking about carbohydrates, especially complex carbohydrates, like you more times than not can fit those in without the negative effects of the giant sugar spikes, the like negative effects of the sh uh, headaches, like the sugar headaches and things like that. And I'm just curious on your perspective, like what you think about that. Darn.
Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what happened to my internet. It just decided to stop working all of a yeah, sudden. I think it cycles in, in Tom's River because ours does that on occasion too. But oh my gosh, I'm that's sorry. Okay. I, okay. I always take sorry. notes like when it cuts out just in case, and that way I could pick it up and edit it and it's seamless. Okay. All right. So I'll just pick up from my question for you. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what was I saying? Oh, yeah. And when it comes to carbs, my big question, or not even a question, like I always kind of think like it gets caught up, like the carbohydrate discussion turns into no carbs or all carbs or whatever. Because when we think carbs, we think cookies, ice cream, pizza, and that also has a ton of fat in it. But when it comes to the carbohydrate mm -hmm. foods that most people think of, it's like super sugary, but not really complex carbs. So oh, did I lose you again? No, you're good. I'm still here. Okay. I think so. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. You're, you're frozen, but it's recording on your end. So we're good. So sorry. I'll start that over okay. uh, as long as you can hear me. Um, yeah. So when it comes to the carbohydrate discussion, I always wonder, especially for insulin resistant people, when it comes to complex carbohydrates, the ones with fiber, the ones that are going to be slower to be absorbed, are those same negative effects going to happen for those people? Like what, what can they realistically get away with when it comes to carbohydrates on a low carb diet? Can they afford more if there's fiber or not? It's all just carbs or carbs or carbs. So as far as insulin, response definitely goes. the foods that are like higher fiber help for sure. The carbs that are higher fiber, I think those definitely help more than the ones that are just carbs with fat, because anything that's going to turn into sugar is going to be worse for the patients that have insulin resistance, if that makes sense. Um, as far as I know, like I'm not very big on like the nutrition aspect of it but i know that fiber helps when you're digesting the carbs and turning it into sugar to where it's not going to be turned into the sugar that's going to like spike your sugar levels and then have your body secrete a bunch of insulin so i've seen this a lot of time in red studies where if you eat a carb with something that's higher fiber you're you don't get that kind of like glucose spike that's going to cause your body to secrete a bunch of insulin. So it's obviously better to have foods that are carbs, but higher in fiber than those that aren't. Gotcha. Yeah. Because I know at least for my own clients, mm -hmm. I like one of the things that we work on early on is listen, you can have carbohydrates, but if you're going to have carbs, just make sure there's some sort of fiber in it. And then if you do that more times right. than not, you're going to get your fiber up to a place where it should be. And you're not going to experience all those negative effects that come with sugar spikes. Right, exactly. And that's that's what you try to avoid. In patients that have insulin resistance, you want to avoid those sugar spikes because when your sugar spikes, your body secretes insulin. So it's just that like vicious cycle that you want to try to avoid. Yeah, yeah. And if anybody listening is like, how the heck do I do that? It's not as like complicated as many people think it is. It's really simple. Like if you enjoy having a sandwich for lunch, instead of putting on uh, instead of putting it on white bread, put it on whole grain, rye sourdough, something like that. Sourdough has got probiotics too. So two, two for one right mm -hmm. there. And then if you have, if you really enjoy pasta, instead of having the traditional pasta, go for chickpea, lentil, something like that. And then you also get a ton of protein in that too. And in the morning, instead of your muffin, instead of that, like we, I push these things like no other, like mighty muffins are a really good other option because they have a ton of fiber in them as well. Or you can have fruit or something like that with skin that will mm -hmm. have extra fiber in there and slow it down. Because another thing too that people mm -hmm. get screwed up on is the sugar and fruit. But it's like, yes, there's fructose in it. But when you have fiber in the equation, it doesn't get absorbed as fast. So it doesn't have the same sugar spike as a pixie stick. Right, exactly. And if I do have patients, I do do this sometimes where if I have patients that kind of struggle with that concept and they want to, they want to know when their spikes are and I have those insulin resistance, we have these, the continuous glucose monitors, if you ever see patients wearing them. Oh, they're um, in the fitness space too. The <laughs> There's plenty of people oh, really? freaking okay. out about every know. little spike every little glucose spike. So I do do that sometimes with my patients. If they're, if they're interested and they want to know, I'll say like, hey, wear this for two weeks 
and see what happens every time you eat, like check your sugar and watch the, the spikes. And then I think sometimes like if you have that like tangible thing that you can see, like patients that like need to see that in front of them to say like, oh, I ate that and my sugar spiked up to 150, 160, whatever it was, then they have that tangible thing in their head to be like, okay, I need to avoid doing that. Or they eat something and they eat, then they eat something with high fiber, whatever it is. And then their sugar just kind of levels out. Then they're like, okay, now I know what I'm doing. And it can kind of help to um, like implement those lifestyle changes. Gotcha. Gotcha. And just for anybody listening right now that is not diabetic, that does have a CGM on because they heard some influencer talk about it. Can we put to rest the <laughs> idea that your body should never have any sort of spike whatsoever? Right. Exactly. Your body is going to have a spike. That's just normal. Like that's normal reaction to what we eat. And that's normal, what we call homeostasis, keeping our body where it should be. So it's okay to have sugar spikes. That's why we don't diagnose somebody as a diabetic. If they have one spike of 150, like that's not, that's not what we diagnose diabetics. We use the hemoglobin A1C, which is your average over three months which means your average glucose readings, your average glucose of every single day, 24 hours in a three month period of time. That's how we diagnose it. So one or two spikes here or there is totally normal. Like I'm sure that I ate a couple gummy worms before, like I'm sure my glucose spiked up to like, who knows what it was before. Like, and that's okay. That's normal. All right, cool. I'm glad we got that out of the way because I can say it's all blue in the face, but if you have a legitimate doctor saying, listen, it's normal, it carries a little more weight. Um, pun intended because we're talking about weight loss. Now let's transition into the exercise. Now, before I get into the nitty gritty of like exactly what we should be going for, are there any exercise risks that are elevated or does exercise increase any risk for anything on these medications? Not that I know of. No, exercise just kind of helps. And I think whatever exercise you do, whatever works for you, I will not speak to what type of exercise because I am not an expert in that. But there are no what I call what we call contraindications. If you're on these medications, there is no contraindication to exercising as long as you are eating. I will reiterate that. If you are going and you are on these medications and you're not eating and you're not drinking water and you go to exercise and you feel lightheaded and dizzy, please stop and please eat and please drink water. So these would be the reasons to not exercise, but there is no reason that the medication itself would cause you to not be able to exercise. See, see that's where I got to disagree with you. I'm one of those hardos on Instagram. That's like, if you're not puking, if you're not fainting, then you just don't want it bad enough. And if you're in my boot, you if you're in my it. boot camp and you can't do what I'm telling you, then you're just lazy. You, you're just, you don't deserve it. I hope everybody can sense the sarcasm yeah, because that is a legitimate thing that happens. <laughs> people will be in like exercise classes or will see people on Instagram that are like dying. Exercise does not have to be that way. Let me repeat that. Exercise does not have to be torture. Does not. Okay. You should. No. I have patients that come to me and they do like, they work out. They tell me that they do hit workouts and then they walk their dog and then they do this. And I'm like, what, how much are you working? I was like, are you okay? Like that concerns me. Like you don't need to work out that much. Yep. It's okay. I promise. And I'm telling you from a medical perspective, it's okay. And fun fact for the people that do do that, you're actually getting worse results than if you do less, more concentrated work because exercise is kind of like medicine and the fact that you can overdo it. A do it. There is a dose dependent relationship when it comes to exercise. If you do too much, you will have a negative hormonal response to exercise. You will yeah. not get results yeah. that you want. You will elevate your injury risk. You will have a much harder time. The more, so I've read a lot on this because I've had PCOS and struggled with it and even with the insulin resistance, but when we increase our cortisol levels, when you do these crazy intense exercises and we're under what we call our fight or flight response, we increase our cortisol levels. Our cortisol is a stress hormone. And when that goes up, our insulin goes up. We hold on to everything because like I said, fight or flight, our body thinks that we are in fight mode. So it is not going to 
burn anything. It's going to hold on to every single thing that we eat and we're not going to be able to lose weight. Yeah. And that is a contributing factor when it comes to like runners, for example, that like run absurd amounts of mileage and can't lose a pound because they never give their body that break. When it comes to cortisol and other hormones as well, they're should always be an acute spike when you're exercising, because if there isn't, then you're really not challenging your body in any meaningful way. But the key is to have it come back down because when you exercise right. more, the rate of how fast it comes down increases. But if you keep doing it over and over and over and over again and never get a break and sleep like crap and eat like crap, you're setting your body up for a very bad time. I'll just leave it at that. But if we're talking right. about what to do, we have covered what not to do. Okay. The worst things you could do <laughs> is do too much and do nothing. So what's that sweet spot for most people to burn the most body fat? Because let's be honest, that's really what a lot of people are after when they're on these medications, like to bring their body weight down to reduce body fat levels. And the best way to bring body fat down, especially is to focus on building muscle because your body will prioritize muscle maintenance and muscle building, even in a calorie deficit. So fun fact, when you guys lose a pound of weight, it's not just a pound of fat. It's a pound of fat that, or sorry, it's a percentage of fat. It's a percentage of lean body mass and a bunch of other stuff too. So when you exercise and you prioritize le lean body mass being maintained, building that lean body mass, that muscle and bone, then you are going to burn more fat per pound, if that makes sense. Okay. So let's just say like you are going to lose 50% fat, 50% muscle without working out. Now you can burn 75% fat, 25% muscle, which means you're burning more body fat. So muscle is the way to go. And then that's also going to lead to bone growth as well. So if you're osteoporotic or things like that, very, very, very beneficial. Now, the way to do that is pretty simple. The simplest way I can put it is whatever you decide to do, whatever method you choose, there's definitely a better way to go about it than a lot of other ways. But the key thing is to do more. And when I say more, that's heavier weights, more repetitions, doing more time on something, assuming that it's not causing uh, uh, any orthopedic issues or doing more in less time or doing let or doing the same amount of work in less time. So I know I went off on a tangent there, but that's pretty much it in a nutshell. So if you want to do this in the best way possible, you want to hit every single muscle in your body. Now that doesn't mean do bicep curls, tricep extensions, shoulder raises, calf raises, quad extensions. Like you don't need to do it that way. There's these beautiful exercises called compound exercises, which involve more than one joint. So there's isolation exercises. Like I just mentioned the bicep curls, the tricep extensions, which you could do, but most people don't have enough time to do a machine or to do an exercise for every single little muscle. So compound exercises involve multiple joints, and that means that they affect multiple muscle groups. So when you do a push-up, it's not just your chest. It's your chest, your triceps, and shoulders all in one go. So you're going to get more bang for your buck. And on top of that, when you do compound exercises, you get a better hormonal response than you do from isolation exercises. So your body responds in a way that allows you to build more muscle and burn more body fat, which is awesome. So if you want to do a really bare, like bare minimum of a workout that'll get you really good results, do something where you push something where you pull something with your legs and something with your abs. So if you guys want sample ones, I have my toned in 20 workouts, which I'm also going to toss in the show notes, just four exercises you do for 20 minutes, do as many rounds as you can. Okay. So when we're doing as many rounds as we can, that's going to increase sets. That's going to increase repetitions. And if you can use more weight over time, you're going to get a lot of work done in as little as 20 minutes. And you can do this from home. You don't even have to go to the gym is going to the gym better. In my personal opinion, yes, because you have access to machines. So if you're the type of person that has lower back pain or has some sort of like issue when it comes to an injury, like you had surgery or something, machines are your best friend because if your leg is broken, guess what? The other leg, you, the other upper half of your body still works. You can still exercise. So going to a Planet Fitness that has every machine that you'll need for 10, 20 bucks a month is a very, very good investment. 
and they've got circuits there too that you can literally just go in and do the circuit like and that'll hit pretty much every single exercise and the real thing that holds a lot of people back is just knowing what you're doing because when we're in there if you have a plan you are going to execute way better than if you just walk in there and you're like well i'm in the gym i came to work out not really sure what i'm doing but we're going to figure it out that usually just leads to walking on the treadmill for about 30 40 minutes and leaving so again check out those toned in 20 workouts they all have exercise videos attached to them. All you do is click on the actual exercise and there's a YouTube video of myself or a professional that I trust that shows you how to do it. So if you're going to be doing so, that. No, that's a great resource. Yeah. yeah. And if you're going to be doing that, try to aim for two to four times a week. Okay? Notice I didn't say every single day. A lot of people go way overboard with this. Two to four workouts, strength workouts per week is an amazing target. It's a very sustainable target and it's going to serve you way better. Like one week of going seven days a week and crushing it and then getting burnt out is not going to do the job of two to four workouts for years. Just keep that in mind. It's always the long game we want to focus on. And then the other thing is right. cardio and steps. When it comes to steps, there are positive health effect, positive <laughs> health benefits. I just did a double positive, but anyway, there are health <laughs> benefits from as little as like two and a half thousand steps a day. That is nothing. Somebody sedentary can easily pull that off. Like that's basically like if you don't, if you walk to your car and take the stairs at work, you probably are hitting 2.5. But we always hear 10K, 10K, 10K. And I'll be honest, I've seen a lot of clients get incredible results in that five to seven and a half K range because it's still elevated on average compared to most people. And there's still benefits. It's just a matter of how, me how much betterist we can be. <laughs> like if I were to give a, <laughs> a technical term here, it's like 2K is great, 8K is awesome, 10K is better and 15, 20K is like, holy crap, you're just Superman and Superwoman. <laughs> so that's no, that's great because yeah. a lot of a lot of the uh, patients that I that I deal with and that I um, that I prescribe the medication, they're always asking like, "What do I do? How do I work out? How much? How long? How many days a week? All of these things." So everything you're saying is like a great resource and like awesome information that I can go and give to my patients. Now. Absolutely. And I also forgot to mention that that resource is for any equipment. If you have dumbbells, if you have bands, if you have nothing, there's body weight exercises on there too. Ton there's 20 of them. So have at it guys, like enjoy it and get, just get moving. That's really the key. These are meant for beginners. Mm -hmm. Just get moving. Cause at the end of the day, Absolutely. regardless of whatever we just told you, making an effort and just putting in the work and not expecting perfection is the biggest thing that you need to do is just do the damn thing. Let's stop overthinking it. Let's stop thinking about how it has to be perfect. Just do it because even a, a bad plan or like the world's worst workout done consistently is going to get you better results than doing nothing at all. Right. Of course. And the studies have shown that exercise and taking that time to yourself, whatever time it may be, just improves so many things. Mental health, our lifestyle, just usually makes you a happier person for the most part. Absolutely. And even independent of nutrition, <laughs> if you didn't change anything and you just exercised, metabolically, you are healthier. Because of when you build muscle, metabolically, it changes a lot of things. So if you can build that muscle, that's the name of the game you're in such a prime position to get the best results possible. And when you do it with this medication and get rid of the food noise and finally get your body into a place where you can like be in control, it's game over. You've got this. Oh yeah. And you're going to get much better. You're going to get much better results with these medications. And a lot of the things that you like patients may talk about too, is when they do have a lot of weight to lose and they have, they'll say like, Oh, am I going to get like, loose skin or these sort of things. If you do the lifestyle changes with these medications and you work out and you're building that muscle, you won't deal with a lot of those things. You won't have that loose skin because you're going to be losing weight the way you should at the right rate. You're not losing an excessive amount at one time and you're going to build that muscle and build like 
really good lifestyle changes. I'm so glad you brought that, you that up. That you carry forward. Because I definitely didn't want to skip over this. And that's the rate of loss. Now, just curious, when it mm -hmm. comes to the studies, what is a typical rate of loss for somebody with these medications? So usually it's about like one, we want about like one pound. Like one they didn't say exactly how much, pe yeah, one pound per week. Yeah. One pound per week. Um, if you, some patients will lose more. Um, the study, I'm pretty sure the study didn't touch on exactly how much they lost per week. They only touched on like overall, they lost about four, like the average was 14.9% of their body weight mm -hmm. over that 68 week period in that study. But I aim personally for about one pound a week with my patients. If they lose 0.5, if they lose 1.5, that's okay too. But I also don't want my patients losing weight super fast either. Because that's just, that's not what you want. You want something that's sustainable. Losing a pound a week is the average and what we would really like our patients to do. Losing any more than that usually to me sends up like a red flag, like maybe they're not eating enough. They're not really they're doing too much sometimes or they're working out too much or whatever it is, or they're for the most part, it's usually that they're not eating enough. And that sends a red flag to me. That's like, Hey, we need to talk about this. What are you eating during the day? Cause losing too much weight too fast. Isn't good for our body either. There, yep. And that's definitely one of the big <laughs> things I wanted to touch on too, because I know I tell everybody like anywhere from half a pound to like 1% of your body weight, like that 1% seems to be like the tip of the iceberg as far as how fast you want to lose. Cause that's based on studies that were done on like elite bodybuilders. So obviously general population is going to be a little bit different, but Hey, I mean, if these are the people that are the best at building muscle, burning body fat, there's something to be learned there. And right. And it's, yeah. it's, I always say it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yep. It's a marathon. This is a lifelong change. This is a lifelong weight loss. This is not a sprint. If you think you're going to lose 10 pounds in a month, I don't want that. Yep. There are some patients that may lose that depending on how much they need to lose and how high their BMI is, because I'm sure, you know, if you have patients, I have had patients who have BMIs in the sixties, like a BMI of 60 you cut their calories in half even without even the medication and they're going to drop weight very quickly. Yep. But if you have a patient whose BMI is 30 and they're on these medications, they may only lose 0.5 to a pound a week and that's okay. That's what I want. Yep. And another thing to touch on too is the difference between fat loss and weight loss, because especially when it comes to exercise, people that are including exercise, a lot of times in the beginning, you won't lose any weight, but you're losing a lot of inches. So it's very, very important to either one, have some sort of body measurements going in, like at the very beginning. Uh, for my clients, I do hips, waist, and chest, like tuck it under your armpits and go across do the narrowest part between your like ribs and your hip bone, and then the widest part around your butt and your pelvis, and then compare those. But if you don't want to do that, like especially the people that are in that very elevated BMI range, have a pair of clothes that is very form fitting and use that as your gauge and then test it once a month. Like first of the month, you could play the song. It's the first of the month. And then you could put on your clothes and see that you're leaner. And even if the weight didn't change, you know, you burn body fat. And if your weight didn't change at all and you're looser in the clothes, you know, you built some muscle too. So you're on track. You're doing everything that you should be doing. I'm telling you right now as a nutrition coach, as a personal trainer, I am so happy when this happens. Because that means you are recomping your body in the best way. You're not under eating. You're eating exactly how much you should. And you're maximizing the amount of uh, muscle that you could build in this new phase. There's a thing called newbie gains. It lasts for like a year or two when you first start exercising, like with weights. And that's what happens. Right. Absolutely. And that's why I encourage my patients to lose weight at a appropriate rate and not lose weight super fast and excessive amounts, but do it the right way. And that's why I think it's so important to combine these medications with lifestyle changes and implementing 
that two to three day a week, you were saying workout and implementing those lifestyle changes because losing weight too fast isn't good either. 100%. Well, that was a lot. <laughs> I, I thought we were, we were doing so good in the beginning, really condensed. And I'm like, damn, this is going to be like a lot of really condensed information. It's going to be good. And here we are at an hour and a half. <laughs> so for, sorry. oh no, I'm very happy. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm like, I feel bad for keeping you. And for everybody listening, thank you no, you're good. so much for sticking with us because you really care about this and you really want to learn. So that speaks volumes in itself. So thank you guys so, so much. Um, and if you know somebody who's on the medication that you know needs to hear this, send it their way and let them know, like, listen, this is a doctor. This is a personal trainer together telling you what you need to know and just send it their way. Or if you have a group post it in there, whatever, but let's get this good information out to the people that really, really need it. Now, Gabby, I know you're not yes, huge on social media or anything, but is there, do you want to tell people if they're in the New Jersey area where they could come see you, if they do want a professional that knows their stuff when it comes to this? Yeah, sure. So I'm, like I said, I'm not in social media. I do have one. I think it's like private though. I guess I should make one. Um, that's a public one, but, um, we are at community medical center. We have a, it's one of our, it's the resident run clinic. Um, and actually it's not like official official yet, but I will be taking a full-time faculty position and be a part of the resident clinic. And I will be seeing patients on my own at that residency clinic. So, um, it is at Community Medical Center. It is in our Riverwood to Riverwood One building. I'm so sorry. I should probably know this. Um, in Tom's River, um, it's the I am faculty practice. I could probably find the number and get it for you if well, you want. If you send it to me, um, I'll put it in the show notes. But yeah. Yeah, I could give it to give you the number if people are interested in, but there are other providers in the area, obviously, but I would highly encourage if you don't come to see myself or any of the other residents in the clinic, go to a provider that has some background in obesity medicine or is passionate about obesity medicine. I would encourage you to obviously do your own research, but listen to providers and medical professionals who have been trained on these medications and be weary of the things that you see on social media and the people that are selling the compounding things because there are med these medications can really help and we really want to help people, but do it the right way and make sure that you're getting monitored by a medical professional. And I also, I highly encourage my patients to find a coach and somebody that can help them with the diet and lifestyle changes and the exercise and things like that, because doing these things in combination will give you the best results possible. Awesome. Awesome. That's the perfect awesome. way to end it. Thank you so much for hopping on Gabby and taking the time to do this because I know a lot of the yeah. quality professionals that we should be listening to are in the trenches, not all over social media, wasting their time and not paying attention to their patients. So thank you so, so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm glad that we could talk about all this stuff and um, be a part of the conversation and hopefully give some insight into all this crazy medications that are out there these days. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thank you guys again for tuning in and sticking all the way through. I will see you guys same time, same place next week until then go kick some ass and I'll see you later.